Four stages narcissist goes through when you leave them. Hello, amazing community. Just as survivors undergo various stages when moving on from a narcissistic relationship, narcissists themselves go through a unique set of stages when left by their primary source of supply. What might surprise you is that these stages don't involve remorse, grief, or an acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Today, we'll delve into these intriguing stages. In this episode, we'll explore the four stages a narcissist experiences after being left by their primary source of supply. If this topic piques your interest and you're ready to explore it with me, be sure to subscribe. Your subscription not only keeps you updated, but also plays a crucial role in spreading awareness about narcissistic abuse. But before we get into it, I want to express our gratitude for having you as part of our community. Your support is invaluable. If you've enjoyed our content and would like to contribute to its growth, consider supporting us on Ko-Fi. Your generosity allows us to create more engaging content for you. As a special thank you, if you decide to join our membership program, we have an exciting perk for you. Your name will be featured in our upcoming videos as a token of our appreciation. It's a small way for us to recognize and celebrate the awesome individuals who make what we do possible. Let's jump into the discussion, and don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe for more insightful content, and share your thoughts in the comments below. Your engagement is invaluable to our community. Stay tuned, and let's get started. Stage 1. The Victim Act First off, we've got the narcissist playing the eternal victim card. Once you're out of the picture, they kick off a masterpiece of lies. They spin a tale based on their version of reality, which is, of course, all twisted up. Whoever crosses their path gets served the same sob story. But here's the kicker. It's all to paint you as the bad guy. They want folks to believe they've been through the ringer, that they've been used and abused, and that they're basically the saddest soul on the planet. Sadly, the kind-hearted fall for this act without realizing it's a trap because the whole cycle is gearing up to repeat with someone new. The narcissist, though, they never take a second to ponder if they had a hand in creating the mess they're crying about. Nope, it's always about what was done to them, not their own role in the drama. They're shedding tears for their wounded ego, not for the actual impact of their actions on someone else. Now here's the real kicker. Do they actually believe their own lies while playing the victim? Yep, they sure do. They're masters at self-gaslighting, convincing themselves they're the helpless victims of someone else's shenanigans. They brew this tale of being abandoned, mistreated, and left out to dry. And let's talk about alienation. They cry about missing their kids, but do zip to be a consistent, present parent, even when given all the time in the world. To look like the saint in the story, they might drop bombshells like, they cheated on me, making themselves out to be the victim. But they won't spill the beans on their own cheating, betrayal, and the havoc they wreaked on the other person. Oh no, that's not in the script. It's all about making themselves look big and blameless. That's the game of victimhood they're playing. Stage 2. The Jealousy Game Moving on to Stage 2. The Jealousy Game Here's the deal. A narcissist relies more on your reactions than you do on theirs. Your life and what's happening in it are like their personal soap opera. And guess what they find super crucial? Broadcasting pics with their new squeeze online, everywhere, just to rub it in. Why? Because they know it stings. It triggers that nagging self-doubt, making you wonder if you weren't enough. The questions start rolling in. Why do they look so happy with the new person? Are they better than me? Did they offer something I couldn't? They go on to do all the things you wished they'd done with you. The holidays, the social media parade, and even making the new person a family member. And you're left there wondering, hold up, I was always a secret. What's this all about? It's a deliberate move to tie you up in knots and make moving on a real challenge. The narcissist wants to mess with your life more than they care about the new one they're flaunting. It's their way of getting back at you for taking control, going no contact, or getting the boot. They're big on punishment, and this is their revenge. But here's the truth. Don't take any of it to heart. It's all a show, a facade, a drama they're putting on. They're just used to playing this game. So, don't let it get to you. It's smoke and mirrors. Stage 3. The Hoovering Attempt Alright, now let's dive into Stage 3. The Hoovering Phase. 
This is where the narcissist can't handle the fact that you're moving on and breaking free from their chains. You're spreading your wings, leaving those dark dungeons they kept you in, and starting a new chapter. But here's the deal. They can't stand seeing you thrive because it messes with their power trip. Their whole game is to keep you suffering because that's where they feel powerful and in control. So, when they sense you moving on, especially on your good days, they might hit you up with a random message, something cryptic that's designed to pull you back into the drama. It could be on your birthday, the no contact anniversary, or any significant day. They want to mess with your progress, trigger regression, and drag you back into the same old cycle. Hoovering is their last ditch effort to regain control. Stage 4, the smear campaign. Moving on to stage 4, and this one's a massive one, the smear campaign. Picture this, when a narcissist can't control you directly, they go for the next best thing, controlling how others see you. They'll reach out to your friends and family, spinning a web of lies upon lies upon lies. The goal? Isolate you and get as many people as possible on their side. They believe this will hurt you big time. Sadly, in some cases, it works. Survivors of narcissistic abuse find themselves heavily isolated when they need support the most. Imagine a work situation where you need a good relationship with your boss, but a colleague runs a massive smear campaign against you, turning your boss against you. It creates chaos, conflict, and a ton of problems. It's a tough reality. But here's the silver lining. Sometimes it doesn't work. It filters out those who don't deserve to be in your life. People who listen to the narcissist are just minions or flying monkeys, not your real friends. In wrapping up this episode, it's crucial to understand that these individuals don't undergo the stages of grief, pain, confusion, or crisis like you do. Their ability to swiftly move on stems from their inability to form genuine attachments. They were never in love with you. Many wonder if they feel the same pain or struggle as you do but unfortunately, they don't. They erase you from their minds effortlessly, treating you like disposable trash. Their life is a mere float. They don't truly live or experience it. Remember, they are highly dissociative and lack the capacity for genuine attachments. These individuals follow a pattern. First, they adopt the victim role, then attempt to incite jealousy. If that fails, they may hoover you back into their orbit, and finally, resort to running massive smear campaigns. That concludes today's episode. Thank you for tuning in and staying with us. Until the next one, as always, let the healing begin and persist. For more insights and personalized guidance, explore our free book and consider a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Find the link in the description to access valuable resources for your journey. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay connected for more empowering content.